Hello there, right, we're going to continue with theme 3C, which is feminist theology and the changing role of men and women. We've already looked at the work of Rosemary Ruther. Now we are going to look at Mary Daly. So let's do a brief introduction to Mary Daly. There's an awful lot on the web out there on her. I've tried to condense it as much as I can, but there's an awful lot of information. Hopefully it will all make sense. So Mary Daly was a radical lesbian feminist theologian, taught at Boston College. Interestingly, she almost always refused to let men into her classes. Uh, so in 1999, a male student actually um, sued the college for discrimination. Daly was suspended and ultimately still refused to comply. And she always stated she found men disruptive. Um, she's been described by um, people such as uh, Lawrence Cunningham as the gold standard of absolute feminism. So you can't get much more feminist than Mary Daly. And she calls on women basically to exodus the church. And here's a great quote from Daly. You get the sort of feel for what she thinks. We can't really talk about belonging to institutional religion as it exists. The women's movement is an exodus community. We can affirm now our promise and our exodus as we walk into a future that will be our own future. Our time has come. We will take our place in the sun. We will leave behind the centuries of silence and darkness. Let us affirm our faith in ourselves and our will to transcendence by rising and walking out together. So here she is talking about the fact that women need to embrace their own futures, leave the patriarchal society, walk away from the church. So she is known as a post-Christian feminist who basically rejects the whole basis of Christianity because it's patriarchal and the Christian God concept because it is basically patriarchal. So for Daly, the goal of human life is for everyone to be free to engage in a journey of growth so that they become more creative, more fulfilled individuals so that they can freely participate in a society and communities that are healthy and liberating and not oppressive. But she would argue that up to this point, the opposite has been the case for women. They have not been able to do this. Instead of the freedom to be on a journey of growth, she would argue that women have been trapped into oppressive roles. They've been told that their biology is their destiny. They've been reduced to objects of men's desires and tools by which to accomplish male goals. So Daly sees society as having created a basically a sexual caste system, a class system, a rigid hierarchy that places the female gender below the male gender. So the current society we have, male dominated, doesn't matter what's happened in the past in terms of liberation, women's rights, it is still patriarchal and male dominated. And Daly believes that the church has played a large role in helping our culture and our societies maintain this uneven caste system. And she thinks it's time for women to overcome the system and the structures um, that force women into a sort of non-being, unable to fulfill their potential. So let's delve a little deeper. So Daly argues that male myth makers constructed an image of the feminine to mould women for their own purpose. And what she's saying is this sort of idea that women are subordinate to men, which is in her opinion, backed up by biblical stories, Adam and Eve, the fall, etc., etc. All these myths about women being inferior have been created by men in order to fulfill their own purposes. She thinks the male is the robber who robs women of their potential, their myths, their energy, their divinity, their very selves. So as she says, patriarchy has stolen our cosmos and turned it into Cosmopolitan magazine. I quite like that quote. 
and it's the prevailing religion of the entire planet whose essential message is necrophilia, the love of death. So here she's talking about men being violent, etc., etc. So she calls on women to have the courage to, as she says it, to see and to be and represent the greatest challenge to the religions of the world. So I think this is an important point here. The ultimate sin to daily is patriarchal religion itself. So that religion that's perpetuated and reinforced these views. But she does acknowledge that women have been complicit because they've lived out the role of the submissive other represented in Christianity as the weak, obedient, the depraved. So if you think about what Ruth has said about Mary being a role model and obedient, meek, etc., Daly would back that up. You know, that those are the role models of women in the Bible. And she goes back to medieval thought, as in Aquinas' thought, you know, men are superior, wise, strong, rational. That's the patriarchal religion that Christianity um, is all about. It parades a male priesthood dressed in its finery, subjugates women to submissive roles. And she says, how can a religion that's so entrenched in patriarchy possibly liberate females at all? And her ultimate argument is it can't, and therefore women need to lead the church, leave the church and establish their own church for want of a better word it's not quite what she calls it look at what she says here the contrast between the arrogant bearing and colorful attire of the princes of the church and she's referring to the priests here and the humble self-deprecating manner and somber clothing of the very few women women was appalling watching the veiled nuns shuffle to the altar rail to receive Holy Communion from the hands of a priest was like observing a string of lowly ants at some bizarre picnic. Speeches were read, but the voices were all male. The senile cracking whines of the men in red. The nuns sat docile and listened to the reading of documents in Latin, which neither they nor the readers apparently understood. So a really damning view of liturgical church services there. Quite like this quote. God's plan is often a front for men's plans and a cover for inadequacy, ignorance and evil. You might want to use that in an essay. So Daly maintains that the language of the Father God legitimizes male supremacy. So the language that's used in the Bible, that's used in religion, that's used in church services, reinforces and gives legitimacy to the fact that women are viewed as inferior. And also, therefore, it leads to the oppression of women. And this is a very famous quote from, um, from Mary Daly. And again, I would learn this one. As God is male, the male becomes God. So implying that, you know, it perpetuates this idea of men because you have a male God, male as superior. The very language is the language of patriarchy. And even when people don't take this literally, the language in its gender form is used to bolster male power and the domination of women. So here she is agreeing with Ruther's view on language as well. And uh, she uses quite uh, emotive um, language there. Uh, so she says, for the God concept to be liberated, to get the correct view of God, the very language of God needs to be castrated. So um, this bit's a little complex, so make sure you get your head around this. Daly links the idea of natural philosophy and the divinely create, created order. So she says, if God is in his heaven, is a father ruling his people, then it's in the nature of things and according to divine plan and the order of the universe that society be male dominated. So she's linked this idea of natural law and those sort of things. So this is her central issue with Christianity. So it's both theological and philosophical. Now, particularly, she uh, has a go at Catholicism here with this. So she's taking as her criticism 
the entire natural law worldview that's embedded within Catholicism and the natural law theory which you would have studied in ethics of Thomas Aquinas. She's attacking those preconceptions of Catholicism itself because God has created it is good but of course it's good because it's a male God and it's a patriarchal God. So I put this slide up just for you to think about it. You know, she argued that the Catholic Church deliberately demoted the role of women, the, the role that women played in spreading Christianity and sidelined them, marginalized them. So it became patriarchal. So let's carry on with this view of the patriarchal God. OK, she has a go at Catholicism when it comes to Protestantism, because it's not so entrenched in natural law. Her targets are more doctrinal. So the idea of the incarnation, the cross and more linguistic to look at the language that's used. So she agrees with Ruther um, that, you know, she's suspicious about uh, the interpretation regarding male centred religious language. But she, unlike Ruther, just pushes it forward. Ruther tries to dismiss the areas of uh, male language within the Bible and then find that sort of golden thread, that prophetic tradition. Ma uh, Mary Daly doesn't do that. She just rejects Christianity in its entirety, including its Jewish um, roots. And we go back to that quote, if God is male, she famously declared, then the male is God. For her, it's too late. Nothing can be done to salvage it. Ruther thinks otherwise. So for these reasons, theological and philosophical, Daly rejects the God image of Christianity in favour of participation in what she calls an ultimate reality, a God concept beyond and beneath, outside of the traditional Christian view. So for her, the image of God is the creative potential in all human beings. Obviously for her, it's a potential for women that has not been realised due to the patriarchal nature of society and religion. She, needs, she thinks we need to transform the symbols of God. God is transformed from a noun, Father, Lord, King, to a verb whose form destroying, form creating, transforming power that makes all things new. God is being and becoming. Now I'm going to look at this, look her view on nouns and verbs in a little more detail later on but first we're going to look at this so daily accuses augustine and aquinas of misogyny women hatred so that's catholic view as they deny women the power to reach their full potential she says that the males we talked about how um, women have been sidelined in the old testament and with, again she's having a real pop of catholicism here the male constructs the feminine as the originator of the evil in the myth of the fall in humankind in Genesis 3 and its interpretations. Eve is represented as the scapegoat of male sexual guilt. And of course, scapegoat theology is also there, the cross of Christ. And daily encourages women to enter a new fall, a fall into freedom involving eating the forbidden fruit of wisdom all over again, actualizing yourself. And she says there are two images of women, the Virgin and the Whore, representing the image of the pure Virgin Mary and the fallen Mary Magdalene. And these images have been exploited and developed in patriarchal art and culture through the ages to oppress women, deny them their equal rights and brainwash them into a dependent state and, of course, dependent on males. So there you have the, these two views, Mary, who is the impossible virgin, but totally submissive to the will of the Father God. And in fact, in some of her writing, she refers to Mary as a rape victim who is um, impregnated without her agreement by God. And then we have Mary Magdalene, traditionally in the Bible, the fallen women. And if you're not like the Virgin Mary, then you are Mary Magdalene, you know, this fallen Eve type view of women. The, so um, what Daly calls women to do is stop playing the role of the meek, subservient complement to men and to reimagine their power, renew the world. All the pictures need to be repainted, the images reformed. But paradoxically, she does argue that Mary can be, the Virgin Mary, can be adopted by feminism as a symbol of uh, the autonomous woman, 
first woman to fall into paradise. But in her view, she's no longer the rape victim impregnated by God to confirm her in submission to the divine will. And in Daly's thinking, Mary gets liberated and her role echoes back to a sort of pre-Christian era of the great goddess. And this is linked to Daly's idea about whether a male saviour can actually save. And in her book, Beyond God the Father, there's a copy of the front cover there, Daly addresses issues surrounding the incarnation of Christ and the gender of a man. And she argues for, for a crucial underlying assumption. She says, the underlying and often explicit assumption in the minds of theologians down through the centuries is that the deity could not have deigned to become incarnate in an inferior sex. So she talks about the inevitability of Jesus being male. There was no chance whatsoever that God would come incarnate in the form of a woman due to the repression and suppression of women by religion. And for her, she sees it completely irrelevant as to whether Jesus chose women disciples like Mary Magdalene, which is often used as an example of Jesus being unlike the patriarchal society um, of his time. She's not bothered by that, it, it, whether he had promoted radical feminism or not. The, because for her, the image of Christ portrayed in the scripture as male and patriarchal is the issue. Jesus's gender is relevant because Jesus is the subject and women are portrayed as passive recipients of Christ's blessing. So it's still the male giving the blessing to, to the women who are subordinate. So the Bible for daily is a partial account because women's roles are defined already by the writers of the Bible, which she presumes to be men and she'd be right. And she would agree with Daphne Hampson, who we looked at criticizing Ruther in the last PowerPoint, that the whole narrative is so riddled with patriarchy and its assumptions and its plot that it's beyond saving. So we can also see how the church in history even worked out the elements of the plot. That's what she thinks. One hint of Mary being a virgin, and remember that possible translation um, from the Greek is not necessarily virgin, it could mean maiden. In just one gospel, Matthew, becomes reformed into the whole doctrine of the pure virgin. So what she's saying here is that the, the men have, have taken that one tiny little assumption that Mary is a virgin and run with it in order to subjugate women. And of course, that then links into the whole contrast with Eve, that sort of lustful tarnishment through having sex with Adam, you know, this fallen woman. And of course, um, this is quite interesting because as Jesus had brothers, you know, Matthew 30, 55, we read about brothers jo Joseph, Jude, James and Simon. Um, and allegedly James is the one who wrote the letter of the New Testament and is thought to become an e a leader of the early church. It's unclear, actually, how Mary's purity could have been maintained for long. And so for Daly, can a male saviour save? And for her, the answer is certainly not because the whole doctrine of the incarnation is a gender-based account of how God entered the world and it's used to boost the dominance of men. And it's also, she sort of says a bit like um, Ruther here, it's an idolatrous idea. And, uh, you know, God can't have a human form. The divine reality is beyond us. We can't truly understand God. So let's go back to this um, idea of um, God as a verb and God as a noun that Daly looks at. And there's quite a bit about this in the textbook. So if we look um, at Daly um, in terms of language, she's, when she's talking about the description of the goal in life, okay, how you want to be in life, the words that we tend to use for this are verbs. It's about acting, it's about being, it's about changing, it's about moving, it's about actualizing, etc. However, she argues, the problem is that women are treated as objects. So therefore, women are treated as nouns. And one of the themes in theology that has helped to turn women into objects is this static view of God, defining God as a noun 
rather than a verb. Traditional theology views God as a changeless, a static being, a creator, a ruler, and there you have the use of nouns. Remember, Davy has a very different view of what the divine is. And Daly thinks that patriarchal images of God, father, ruler, king, lord, whatever, reinforce the notion of God as a noun. So therefore you get this sort of view of a white bearded man in the sky. This God, says Daly, needs to be dethroned. And she thinks that in uh, theology, there's three versions of this noun God. You've got this sort of God who's like a stopgap, um, the God of the gaps, a, a God that's used as an explanation for anything that's unknown to us. Or we've got the God of otherworldliness, the one who gives rewards and meets out punishments after death. And then finally, you've got this God who's a judge, this judge of sin who insists on rules and establishes roles for men and women. So you can see there how nouns are used for God. So these images of God are static because they don't inspire creativity, dynamism and growth as far as Daly is concerned. And Daly believes that Jesus has also been turned into a noun by the church, the otherworldly God-man who's the model for all Christians to follow. Women can and should follow Jesus, though they can never hope to be as spiritual for men sorry, spiritual as men, since they're the wrong gender. However, Daly asks, why should there be one model for human living? So for Daly, God is not a noun, God is a verb. I can't stress enough, you've got to get your heads around this because this, this is key in her thoughts. So if you're writing essays on Daly, this would need to be in, I would think, in almost every topic they're going to set. What must we do, says Daly, we've got to consider God as a verb, to see God as a, in a process of becoming with the universe, as the force that helps you to become the people, the person you were meant to be. So God is a force, it's a doing, it's a, it's a verb because it makes you do, become, realise, actualise your potential. And for Daly, simply changing from male language to female language of God doesn't address the root issue. It simply perpetuates this idea of God as a noun. And of course, the nouns change to female rather than male. But that is the issue for, uh, for Daly, because you don't have that view through the verbal form of God as this transforming power and the power of being for all persons. So just simply change, changing the name for daily does not work. Wiping out the male language, replacing it with female language is not going to work. So daily thinks that we must see God as this transforming power, as the verbal form. And if we do this, we will come to see that original sin is not disobedience, but it's turning women to objects who are forbidden to develop outside their biological destiny. That salvation is not passive obsess, um, acceptance of the doctrine or worship of a God-man. is that it's participating in being and becoming. We'll also see that worshipping the God of patriarchy, which includes the God-man Jesus, is a form of idolatry. And Daly argues that Christians commit Christolatry and Bibliolatry, you know, the worship of Christ, the worship of the Bible, when they insist that biblical forms of patriarchy are the final truth. And that we'll also see that our goal is to struggle to be free human beings staying open to the future. Because if there's no fall, no frowning judge and no punishment, there's no need of a saviour. So to believe in the power of God for daily is to believe in the power of being and becoming in all people. It's a different view of God. Now, treating women as objects, says Daly, is at the heart of all human violence. And she, in her work, investigates what she calls the unholy trinity of rape, genocide and war. 
And her argument basically is that violence becomes permissible in society when we no longer see human beings as on a valuable journey of being and becoming, but we turn them into objects, we turn them into nouns, which, which are basically a means to increase our pleasure or decrease our pain. So rape, for instance, involves just such an objectification of women. Furthermore, she would argue, a patriarchal society has a vested interest in rape continuing since the fact of rape reinforces the need for males to protect all women. Could this be one reason that the police and other authorities have often disbelieved women who report rape, Daly asks. So she's got an interesting view there that society, in a sense, the patriarchal society wants to or has a vested interest in rape continuing because even though um, it's a horrendous thing, it allows men to establish their dominance by saying that they need to protect women from it. And genocide is and just such another form of objectification. So the enemy, if we look at the enemy within a war when you're wiping out a race of people, is viewed as an object. They've been dehumanized. They're an object possession of a conquering army who can be dealt with dealt with in any way deemed satisfying in the moment. And that includes wholesale murder. So the link between rape and genocide, Daly argues, can be seen in biblical commands to Israel to engage in both activities. And there's the lovely verse, Numbers 31, verses 17 to 18. Uh, where God says, now therefore kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known a man by sleeping with him, in other words, anyone who's had sex, but all the young girls who've not known a man, in other words, virgins, by sleeping with him, keep alive for yourselves. In other words, these humans for daily have become merely objects rather than human beings. They are possessions, they're nouns. War for daily is about masculine dominance, and the promotion of certain virtues which we associate with manliness, courage, bravery, that sort of thing. And society for daily also contains different values, um, so passivity, gentleness, self-sacrifice, and these values are associated with females, the people who are treated as objects by men. And because of these values and these gender assigned values, Daly believes it's a strategy by men to ensure that women don't change the social order. They don't interrupt, interrupt the, the work of this unholy trinity, rape, genocide, etc. In fact, she argues that women who have these feminine qualities are rarely permitted into leadership positions because these are not the values that most influence society. Now, you might ask why I've put a picture of Time magazine with Margaret Thatcher on the front, the first British women, woman prime minister. Well, Daly would argue that, um, you know, women who do have these qualities, uh, you know, that, that are not, um, that do not lend themselves to leadership positions, um, they're stamped out by the men in society. And I thought this was an interesting view for Time magazines because look at what the how Time magazine pictures Thatcher here, Britain's fighting lady. So one might argue that the reason Thatcher got to power, became leader of the Tory party and ultimately prime minister, was because she demonstrated male-like qualities that were acceptable to the patriarchal society of the time and therefore um, she rose to power. Interesting that in Thatcher's cabinet she had no women whatsoever, still very patriarchal, very dominated. Make what you want out of that, but I thought that was quite interesting. So for Daly this fact underscores the need for women to strive not for feminine values but for an androgynous form of life in which they make their own decisions and build their own ethics separate from gender. And how do they do that? Well, David believes that the church is too bound to patriarchy 
to ever become a place where women could find the transformation they seek. So the church is not going to work. She calls herself a post-Christian, calls upon women to be anti-church and leave the patriarchal structure. However, in a patriarchal world, nearly all organisations are to some degrees patriarchal. So that women who enter into a journey of growth, she argues, will need to live on the boundaries of society. They almost need to distance themselves from society as a whole because it's too patriarchal. And in order to do this, they need the support of other women. So it's almost like all women distance themselves from society. And I think this quote nicely explains uh, Daly's view of the church. I had explained that a woman's asking for equality in the church would be comparable to a black person's demanding equality in the Ku Klux Klan. So there she's putting over this idea that for her, it, it cannot be resolved. The, the, the patriarchy is so entrenched, the subordination of women is so entrenched in the church, it cannot be solved. So women need to leave the church, in fact, almost leave society and establish a sisterhood on the border of society with other women. So this term, sisterhood for daily, speaks to finding relationships with other women in order to oppose, to oppose the lovelessness of a sexually hierarchical society. And she warns women that as they attempt to change their lives, they'll be criticised by men. They'll be called names like, she uses words, castrating female, man-hater, unfeminine. Women will also confront criticism from women who've not recognised the true oppression of a patriarchal culture. So she says we're also going to come up to opposition with women who are so entrenched in the patriarchal culture they don't recognise that they're being oppressed. But, Daly says, the sisterhood will offer support. There won't be any hierarchy, there'll be no dogmas, and will assist in bringing women out of the patriarchal spaces and onto a path where they can develop into an androgynous form of living. Now, obviously, there are no men in the sisterhood. So, that's what Daly thinks. Let's have a look at some criticisms of her. Now, black theologian Audrey Lord has actually criticised Daly for refusing to acknowledge the uh, herstory and myth of women of colour. Herstory is just um, a way of looking at history from a female uh, perspective. The severe oppression that they've suffered under greatly outweighs the discrimination of white women. So Audrey Lord accuses um, Daly of not fully recognising um, the oppression of women of colour. And she says, you know, they're much more discriminated against than white women. And so she argues there's a racial bias in Daly's work and a racist indifference to the plight of minorities who suffer the greatest oppression. So an interesting um, critique uh, there of Daly by Audrey Lord. Um, I think you can argue that patriarchy can't assist in explaining why only a few men in a patriarchy use violence against women and why many males have campaigned for women's right over the century. Um, you could argue the first man being Jesus himself who overthrew aspects of anti-women purity, um, the anti-women purity code in Leviticus. Now, Daly wanted women to rule men and was herself a, a lesbian vegetarian. And she quote, famously quoted, I really don't care about men when, in an interview. But isn't that perpetuating the exact dualism that she rejects as oppressive? Instead of men dominating women, she wants to turn it on its head and for women to dominate men. Surely that's the same thing but couched in a different manner. Now, there are also other confusions to avoid, which could also be used as critiques of Daly as well. Don't ever say in, a, um, in an essay that feminists can't be Christians, because feminists like Ruth are argue that Christianity can be restored to a lost prophetic movement, transforming society, but only if patriarchy is rejected. So a male saviour is irrelevant to salvation and the male perspective is a gloss overlaying the true gospel, which can be reconstructed as a gospel of liberation and hope. Now, Ruther thinks that. However, Daly and indeed Daphne Hampson call women out of the church 
and see Christianity as irredeemably patriarchal because they are post-Christian feminists. But there are many feminists who still think you can be Christians. Daly and Hanson don't, but Ruther does. Also, be really careful in stating that the church has no response to feminism because in my opinion that isn't a fair assessment because the Protestant churches have reformed themselves and do now allow women priests and bishops where appropriate to the order of their ministry and I will look at that in my next PowerPoint. So the Church of England ordained women priests in 93 and bishops in 2013. Catholic Church hasn't been so well, hasn't ordained women priests at all, but there was an apologetic mulieris dignitatum which laid great emphasis on equality of the sexes. However, it did fail to reconcile the contradiction in the Bible between the Paul of Galatians, where he says there's neither Greek nor Jew, male nor free, uh, slave nor free, male nor female, all are one in Christ Jesus, and the Paul of Ephesians and Corinthians, where he's saying, wives, obey your husbands, I don't allow a woman to have authority over a man. And of course, the Catholic persistence in advocating the rhythm method of contraception, I think, arguably suggests that the autonomy of women and their right to choose is still being overridden by the male perspective. So I think that's an argument you could have when you're assessing this, evaluating it. And finally, this idea that a male saviour cannot save. Well, that's an extreme position taken by Mary Daly. And it does appear to overlook the revolutionary attitude of Jesus towards women, whom he included in his inner circle and addressed as equals. You know, you've got Mark 5, um, daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace. So arguably, when Jesus emptied himself into the form of a servant, and I'm quoting Philippians 2, 7 there, he also gave up the genderless infinity of God. You know, Yahweh, God in, in Hebrew, I am who I am is what it means. God can't have a gender. And so Jesus is one with God. His gender must be irrelevant for salvation. You know, Messiah is a genderless idea. So therefore, you could argue that emphasis on the gender of Christ, the virginity of Mary, comes later as the male-dominated church hierarchy produced the creeds and imposed uniformity on belief and cast out the so-called heretics such as the Montanists. But the crux of it was nothing to do with gender whatsoever when it occurred at the time. It's only later on that the church has changed things. So to say that a male saviour cannot save is iffy. However, you form your own view on that. So that's Mary Daly. Hopefully you've got a feel for what she thinks and her views on Christianity and how women achieve salvation. Thank you.